Now it's your turn to call us on the Fox 13 News at noon. Let's turn things over to Kathy. Thank you, Frank. Coming up, if you have ever thought that we are prescribing too many drugs in this culture for depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorders, you're going to want to stick around to hear the most outspoken critic in America, a psychiatrist who says all these drugs, in his opinion, are doing more harm than good. He believes, in fact, that drugs like Paxil, Prozac, Ritalin, all these psychiatric drugs can cause people to become irritable, manic, even violent or suicidal. If you have taken them or seen a loved one take them and have a reaction, good or bad, give us a call. You're going to hear a man unafraid to challenge the American medical system. The author of Medication Madness is up next. You're watching Your Turn. If it matters to you, it's important to us. Millions of Americans are taking mood-altering drugs to treat depression or anxiety. Antidepressants are a multi-million dollar industry in this country. Many children diagnosed with ADD or ADHD are on Ritalin or other stimulants. And the age at which children are believed to have depression or bipolar or ADD seems to be getting younger and younger. Have you noticed? But recently you may have also noticed some warnings that some people might have the opposite reaction from what was intended, that the drugs themselves might be causing violence or even suicide. Years before these warnings became general knowledge, my guest was sounding the alarm about the dangers of these psychiatric drugs. Dr. Peter Bregan is probably America's most outspoken critic, first with his book Talking Back to Prozac, now his newest book coming out just this week, Medication Madness. Dr. Bregan, uh, you're a psychiatrist and MD, and we welcome you to your turn today. Good to have you here. It's great to be here with you. It so, really is. Prozac, Paxil, Zoloft, Ritalin, all all these drugs that millions of Americans are taking causing problems? I think overall they do more harm than good. It's, you're putting junk into the brain. You're putting toxic substances into the brain with the hope you'll have a good outcome. Mm -hmm. You're actually creating biochemical imbalances. And if you look at the science, it's very hard to show that any psychiatric drugs are useful. The antidepressants overall, all the studies put together, not useful. No better than a sugar pill. Ritalin for the kids, the stimulants for the kids, all right, it suppresses behavior for a few weeks, and that's about what you can expect, a suppression of behavior for a few weeks. And then, much easier to show are all of the horrendous adverse effects, because they show up in every single study. Now, so you're telling me that, that people who say, I feel better taking these drugs, I feel less depressed, I feel less anxious, that they're not really feeling better? Well, the drugs can cause an emotional anesthesia, so the person may feel less pain, but then they're going to be less effective in figuring their way out of their problems. They may get a temporary euphoria, a bit of a high, in which case their judgment may lead them to do things that are not good for them at all. And often the effects are just last a week or two because the brain fights back. The brain says, this is a toxic substance, I'm going to resist it. And that leads to withdrawal problems. All the psychiatric drugs are not only dangerous to start, Kathy, they're dangerous to stop because you can have horrendous adverse effects. There are many people in your listening audience today who can't get off of Paxil and Prozac and the other drugs. The drug companies hid this for a long, long time. Can't get off because why? Well, they'll get terrible neurologic reactions, shocky feelings in the head, electrical feelings in the body. They'll crash into terrible feelings of sadness and so depression. So they have to just keep taking them well, to it, eliminate the withdrawal symptoms that might accompany. Some people end up needing to take small amounts for, for years. I'm talking about one-tenth of what doctors prescribe uh, because their brain can't get over the effects of the drugs. Okay, in your book, you have taken, I think it's about 50 cases, yes. individual cases, uh, that you studied personally as a psychiatrist, when, interviewed the family members, interviewed the people, and you believe that in all of these cases, these people who uh, took these medications to get better actually displayed violent, suicidal, erratic behavior because they took the drugs? Oh, absolutely. The book opens with the story of a very kind, gentle, and spiritual man 
who uh, saw in a doctor's office that uh, brochure saying maybe he was depressed, so he asked for some Paxil, and it drove him into a state of such severe agitation that he lost his moral control over himself. He wanted to die so desperately to end the pain the drug was causing that he actually drove his car into a policeman, uh, breaking his bones and after he knocked him down he wanted to get his gun to shoot himself but the policeman and a, and a bystander subdued him and after he was off the drugs it was like looking back on a nightmare and this kind of agitation that where you just can't bear to live anymore is not an uncommon reaction on the psychiatric medications it is uncommon for it to go so far that a person commits violence but people also get very high or manic uh, I've seen people, and again, evaluated their cases. I've looked at the medical records, the criminal records. I've made recommendations to the courts, and, and often the, these people get a lesser sentence. On occasion, the court lets them go when they realize that the drugs have done it. But people who have embezzled money in the most bizarre ways, taking money and putting it online on the, <laughs> on the company's accounts, mm -hmm, and then mm -hmm. depositing the money in their own uh, savings account, and doing this over a year, and stealing a million dollars, which immediately became obvious once anybody looked even in the most superficial way. But, but if these drugs are designed to, uh, by now people know that they are designed to stimulate serotonin in the brain, a chemical that causes happiness and euphoria, if they are taking that medication, why are we hearing that people are committing suicide on these drugs? Well, it actually fits exactly with the theory, because the idea is, is that if your serotonin collapses, you're in bad shape. Well, in fact, the brain fights back against the drugs, and you get the opposite of the intended effect. And that opposite effect can even become embedded in the fabric of the brain so that it lasts and lasts and lasts. But basically, if you just look at it clinically, the drugs agitate people, they make them irritable and anxious, give them insomnia, make people more high. And if you do that to somebody who's depressed, you now, instead of just having a sluggish and immobile person who feels terrible and dreadful and is inactive and desperate, and people get very desperate mm -hmm. when they're depressed, you now have somebody who's hyper and energized and overflowing with feelings that they can't bear, and then they begin to do harmful and dangerous things. So how long have you been a psychiatrist? <laughs> well, I'm 72 years old. I've been a psychiatrist so, uh, for uh, all, uh, all your career. <laughs> for all my you, career. So when you started out, you didn't have this point of view, did you? Well, I did, but it was different in that the profession hadn't sold out totally to the drug companies. I got started in college as a college volunteer. We showed that kids could get patients out of a state mental hospital. We became a nationally known program for helping patients get out of mental hospitals without using drugs or anything else. Hmm. The program went on for years. I thought I'd be working as a part of the psychosocial, psychological part of psychiatry. But in the early 70s, psychiatry sold out completely to the drug companies. The drug companies support our journals, they support our conferences, they support our research, they support individual professors. Right, let, 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 me, let me take a break right here, a good place to take a break. Dr. Peter Bregan coming right back, medication madness, and we'll talk about uh, kids on Ritalin and all these drugs. We'll talk about is there depression. We will talk about Tom Cruise and Brooke Shields. We have a lot to talk about when we come back. Dr. Peter Bregan, uh, nationally uh, talking all over the country about this issue of medication madness, which is his latest book. The first one you may recognize, the title, Talking Back to Prozac. Uh, do you not believe, Dr. Bregan, that, that people have depression that needs to be treated with medication? Is that, do people not have chemical imbalances? Well, first, people do get depressed. I mean, depression is a part of normal life in many ways. When we have losses, we grieve. When things don't develop in our lives the way we want, we get right. sad, we have losses. So it's really a human continuum. And some people get terribly depressed. But that doesn't mean it's biological. The idea that individuals have biochemical imbalances in their brain is a PR campaign by drug companies. We can't even measure the activities in the human brain. We'd have no way of 
proving a biochemical imbalance. But we do know from animal research that the drugs cause biochemical imbalances. So it's literally true that the only known biochemical imbalances in the brains of people who are depressed or anxious are the ones caused by the drugs. On the other hand, something like depression is usually really understandable, more than many other psychiatric, psychological problems. Depression is a feeling of hopelessness. So it's you, don't, you don't think that people who come from families where there's a history of depression and anxiety tend to inherit these qualities? Well, it's a scientific issue, and in fact, every study has failed to show any genetic connections for any of the psychiatric disorders. I go into that in great detail in my books, including Medication Madness, that <clears throat> that's just propaganda. We don't have that kind of data. Now, if your mother's depressed and you're two years old or three years old, you may show some signs of feeling depressed, you, even as an infant. So we get feelings from our parents uh, I have, I have a wonderful daughter who's raising a happy young boy along with her wonderful husband. And you can just see that happiness coming from mom and coming from dad. And if mom and dad were stressed out and feeling uncomfortable and unhappy, believe me, you'd see it even in the infant. So even if you take a <clears throat> small amount... Uh, you don't think anybody ever really benefits from taking even a small amount of these medications? I think it's a mistake to try to treat a fundamentally psychological, spiritual problem of feeling hopeless about life by doing something to your brain. You're never going to improve your brain with a psychoactive substance, whether it's alcohol or marijuana or Prozac or Xanax. You're not going to make your brain work better. The brain's much too complicated for that. People need to come to grips with their lives. And we discourage that when we make believe there's a biochemical imbalance. All right, Gary and Sebring, your turn. Uh, yeah, thank you for taking my call. Sure. I believe the gentleman's correct. Um, my dad passed away. I was feeling depressed. My family doctor gave me Prozac. I started seeing things and becoming very, very violent at work. I was only on them 10 days. I flushed them and got off them. And do you feel less that way now that you're off the medication? Oh, I've been off 12 years and feel fine. Very, very, very glad for you. I appreciate that comment. Tanya in Tampa, how about you? We have the uh, exact opposite approach to it. I've been on it for six years and it saved my life. I mean, I feel, I feel better. Um, it wasn't only depression that I had. It was OCD and some other things, a little bit of anger. And it just helps me feel balanced. And when I'm off it, I don't feel, I don't feel okay. What, what do you say to her? Stay with us, if you will, Tanya. Well, I have no desire to take her medication away from her. She's an adult. If she's informed, if she hears both sides of the story, it's up to her. But I would like her to know that it may be the reason she feels worse when she comes off the medication is that she's having a serious withdrawal reaction. If in the first one, two, three, four, five, or even ten days after stopping an antidepressant, you start to feel weird or depressed, or suicidal or violent. The odds are overwhelming. It's a withdrawal reaction. Tanya, are you still on the line? Yes, I'm here. I don't We're feel a suicidal tendencies or anything like that. I just feel that my uh, my self control and my you know mood is not as enhanced. I just feel like it, when I'm not on it, yeah. I know what I can feel like when I am. He, he wants to ask you something, feeling. Tanya. Can can you just answer this? Hold on. Well, sure. well first, I, Tanya, I don't want to discourage you from taking the medication, but. After you stop the medication, and when, maybe when was the last time you stopped, how long does it take before you start to feel uneasy and, and, and in a way you don't want to feel? Does it's it not necessarily an uneasiness. It's whatever just, it is. I, I don't feel myself. I certainly don't feel suicidal, but, but how quick, I don't how feel quickly, well. Tanya, <laughs> Tanya, how quickly after you stop the medication do you start to feel not like yourself? Um, about three or four days. Yeah. That's a withdrawal reaction, Tanya. That, that you do need to know. That's a scientific fact. If within two or three days after stopping a medication, Prozac three days is your typical period because it's a little longer in effect. If you start to feel that way, that's a withdrawal reaction. So then you have a choice about 
going back on the medication, or working with some kind of a trained professional to see if you can get through the withdrawal reaction. The problem that people run into, and this is not necessarily what Tanya will run into, thank you, thank you, Tanya. You can go now. is that over the years they'll start to lose some of their feelings, they'll get more apathetic as the drug wears the neurotransmitters out in effect. And then they try to come off and they get terrible reactions. Uh, when they try to withdraw. So in the, in, the, in the court of public opinion, when Tom Cruise took on Brooke Shields and said, uh, you know, I disagree with you taking something for, you know, for, for depression after uh, childbirth, and she said, I felt like I was going to commit suicide or hurt my baby if I didn't take it, she sort of won that in the court of public opinion. I mean, how, where do you come on that debate? Well, if you look at what was really going on, she was actually quite ill. She had had a difficult birth, she had some hormonal problems, she was fatigued. Uh, this was not just a matter of uh, being a little depressed. Why would a woman become depressed after she gives birth? There are so many reasons. You're tired. Maybe you feel abandoned by your husband. You don't think you it's need to bring surging a family hormones? Together. You don't think there's any well, possibility? No, 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 yes, oh yes, surging hormones, and in fact, a huge drop in the hormones. But that doesn't mean you should further gum up your brain with another drug. What that means is you need good, healthy living, you need good nutrition, you okay. need your husband to spend okay. more time well, with you, I, you okay. need to get your family okay. wrapped okay. around we'll get, you. We have to take a break, and, and he's not going to jump on the couch, right? This is Oprah. This is not Oprah. He's not going to jump on the no, couch I'm like Tom calm. Cruise. I'm That's a, right. I'm, 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 in my elder years, I'm a calm gentleman. <laughs> we'll take a break. Uh, children and antidepressants when we come back. Dr. Peter Bregan is my guest today, and you came up with a term in your book that you created that, that stands for what happens to people when they take these medications, and it's called spellbinding. Explain. Medi medication spellbinding. If you think of alcohol, people who are drinking often think that they're the life of the party when they're the death of the party. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And again, thinking of alcohol, people will get out of control, disinhibited, and become violent, but if they never drink again, they won't be violent ever, ever again. All psychoactive of substances, all substances that affect our brain functions, spellbind us. And I call it medication spellbinding in Medication Madness because it's about the drugs we're prescribed. You may be the last person to know that the drug isn't helping you, that you become flat or you become more irritable or more withdrawn. You may think you're doing better than ever when you're not. As if under a spell. As you if mean. under a spell. It's like the damage the drugs do put us under a spell which makes it difficult and sometimes impossible for us to know what's happening to us. And then we'll attribute it to something else. So we'll be angry, we'll get mad at our wives instead of saying the drug is making me irritable. Or we'll get depressed and suicidal instead of being able to recognize the drug is doing it. And in some cases, m much less common, people actually totally lose their inhibitions and become violent. We created a graphic uh, taken out of your book that some of the symptoms that you said you should look for with your loved ones if you feel like they're falling under this spell, as you say. And, and one of them is that um, the dosage has just been changed up or down, that you might see something then uh, relatively sudden onset and rapid escalation of abnormal thoughts and behavior. I know one of them is a prior history indicating that the abnormal behaviors were uncharacteristic and unprecedented before, like the man who ran over the police officer who'd always been very nice before, and gradual disappearance of the abnormal mental state after stopping the medication. Now, I quickly want to get to kids, all these kids taking Ritalin, taking all these drugs for ADD and ADHD. Should they not be taking these drugs? I don't think we should drug our children when we need to educate them, discipline them, love them, and raise them. Adults, take medications if you're informed, but the growing brain should not be bathed in toxic substances. Ritalin stunts all the stimulants, stunt growth, cause obsessive behaviors, suppress the spontaneity of the child. Many of these children get very depressed on these drugs. But if some parents say, if my child wasn't on Ritalin, he wouldn't be studying, he wouldn't be focusing, he, he wouldn't be doing well in school, he would be failing. Scientifically, there's no evidence that these drugs help with academic performance. I mean, think about it. 
disrupting the brain with the same drugs that we that kids use on the street. But That's, anecdotally, don't the parents live with these children? Don't they see a change in behavior? Well, there is a change. If you give these drugs to a chimpanzee, the same change takes place. The kids become less spontaneous. They become less social. They become less uh, interactive. They uh, are willing to do boring, very dull things. They, they even become obsessive about doing things. It's a harm to the brain that makes the child look better. All right. Beverly in Plant City, your turn. Um, my, hello. My son has a rare medical syndrome. It's LMVBS syndrome. And he was put on Paxil and uh, Cymbalta, Lamictal, Wellbutin. And in November, he had acute kidney failure. So they took him off of all medications. And then when they did put him back on medications, they put him on Paxil alone, and he started opening the car door. Opening the car door. To, to jump out. Well, yeah, while oh. it was going. Jump out, oh. yeah. How, how old was your child when he first started being put on these medications? Well, he's, he's 33 years old now, so you know what I mean? He's been an old, an old good person, but, but uh, just, so, I so just want people to know that, that they will do this. That wow. does happen. People get disinhibited, it's called. They lose control over themselves and do bizarre and dangerous things. Uh, Paxil, probably the worst offender of, of all. Many of the cases in, in Medication Madness are about Paxil. But really, every category of drug can have a similar effect. Okay, I want to spend a couple of minutes left here on uh, people who do feel depressed, hopeless, anxious. Their child has ADD or ADHD. Um, if not medication, what? We need to re-empower human beings to take charge of their lives. It's easiest to see with children. If your child's out of control, your child needs discipline. You, the parent, need a parenting class. You may need some family counseling. You maybe read some good books on parenting. Out of control behavior in children, I mean, this is really a brilliant deduction, isn't it? Has to do with lack of discipline. And the most common cause is confused disciplinary principles <clears throat> in the family. And so for adults, but, you, you believe family counseling or individual counseling for depression is better than taking the well, drugs? Well, everything is better than taking drugs for depression. Depression is loss of hope. Religion, sports, exercise, love, romance, all of the things that make up life. Finding the courage to live again. Finding the strength to live again. Counseling can be very helpful for that, providing the counselor doesn't send you for Paxil as well. <laughs> Wow. It's, uh, you must have gotten a blowback somewhere from this pharmaceutical industry or the American Medical Association because you're saying everything counter to what is going on in our culture today. Yes, it's very, very risky to take the positions I take. <clears throat> and that's why you don't see more doctors doing what I'm doing. It's not because the science isn't with me. The science is with me, but the power and the money, we're talking billions of dollars, is with the pharmaceutical companies, the AMA, the American Psychiatric Association, the National Institute of Mental Health, what I call the psychopharmaceutical All complex. Right. We will take a break. Right back again with the name of this very interesting book. Back in a moment. Uh, the book is Medication Madness. Dr. Peter Bregan, his new website is bregan.com. And uh, lastly, you recommend therapy over drugs. What, what do you look for in a therapist that would help you instead of taking these medications? Look for have... someone who helps you the very first time you meet them because they're full of enthusiasm, interest, and they don't look depressed. <laughs> Find somebody who's going to care about you, take an interest in you, help you get empowered. Not tell you you got something wrong in your well, brain. You, it's get a, you empowered. It's a fascinating, controversial point of view. It's been a pleasure having you, Dr. Bergen. Pleasure. Yeah, good pleasure luck to, to you. Here. Book, Medication Madness. Have a great afternoon, everyone.